Last week, we looked at what might be the thesis verse for the whole entire book of Acts. Okay, this would be like the, the, the verse that really is the table of contents and the direction of where the whole entire book goes, and that is Acts 1.8. If you want to memorize a verse in the book of Acts, this would be a good one. Acts 1.8 says this. It says, but you will receive, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The, the, the book of Acts, it's really a journey of these 120 disciples, male and female, um, that really grows to be thousands of followers of Jesus, male and female. And it's the story of their journey of going from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. But the significant thing about them going is not that they arrive at their particular destination. What is noteworthy is what they carry with them as they go. And what they carry with them is what we see in verse eight. It was what was on them. And this was the Holy Spirit. Wherever they went, power followed because the Holy Spirit would come on them. Now, why does the power matter? The power, listen, the power matters because without power, it is the mission of man and not the mission of God. Without power, it is the mission of man and not the mission of God. Through his power, God is never never ineffective, hallelujah. He's not ineffective. But when men and women carry the message of God without the power of God, they will continually run into walls of ineffectiveness. So they waited. We looked at this some last week. Who here hates waiting? Okay, some of you enjoy it. But, but, but. They, they were told, go and wait until you, were, until you were clothed with power from on high. They were told to go and wait, but note this, they were not told how long they would have to wait. They ended up waiting 10 days. That's still a long time, but they were not told that. Because think about it, if you're told to wait 10 days, it's like, well, I, I know when the end is. But waiting on the Lord doesn't always look like that. Sometimes it's just wait and you don't know when. But let me ask you, do we believe he is worth the wait? And the question is, how long would you be willing to wait to receive power from on high? Now, the question is, what did they do while they wait? And what is an appropriate way for us to wait upon the Lord? I don't like formulas. I'm not saying this is the only way to wait. But what we see in Acts 1.14 is they were waiting in prayer. They were waiting in prayer. It says in Acts 1.14, they all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Now we don't know exactly what they were praying, but I believe that their prayers were specific and not random. They knew the mission that had been given to them and they knew the power of the promise that had been given to them. They knew the mission and they knew the promise. So I can't guarantee it, but I I would imagine some of their prayers over those 10 days look something like, come upon us, God. Pour out your spirit on us, God. We are ready for your power. We need your Holy Spirit. We, we, We desire your Holy Spirit, which I think matters is that you actually desire. It's one thing to recognize your need. It's another thing to like, Many humans recognize their need for a God. It really changes when you recognize that you actually need to desire that God. And something in them was probably shifting is that we desire more of you. We desire your Holy Spirit. This reminds me of this verse in, in, cha- in Luke chapter 11, verse 13. It's the words of Jesus. And remember, Luke wrote Luke and Luke also wrote Acts. And here's what it says, the words of Jesus in Luke eleven thirteen. 13. If you then... Though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more, how much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? How much more? Any of y'all know that you're not supposed to give your children like terrible presents? Like no one's that twisted. Even you know how it's like, you know, your kid, you've threatened him. It's like, well, you're going to get coal in your stocking. Like no one does that. It's like even the kid that was terrible that year, you give him something good because they're your children. How much more? How much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And let me ask you, are you asking for the Holy Spirit? This verse says that if you ask, he is waiting to give it. If you want the Holy Spirit, then ask. 
If you want the Holy Spirit, just ask. And now, I'm not referring to receiving the Holy Spirit in conversion or receiving the Holy Spirit in salvation. When we repent, Acts 2, 38 and 39, they say, what must we do to be saved? And it says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. That what happens at that moment is that we are filled with the Holy Spirit and that sin is removed, his spirit replaces it, and we become the place where God's presence dwells. And we know throughout scripture, that place was the temple. We become God's house. But I don't think that's what Jesus was talking about in Acts 1, 5, when he said, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I believe verse five points to what Jesus explains in verse eight that we've already read. It says in, a, in, a, in, a, in verse eight, what we see is it says that you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. I believe that's the baptism that Jesus was referring to here. Why did they need this? Why was this so important? Because they needed to receive the Holy Spirit to empower them to be witnesses. Can I just say this? It's like when you were asked like, what is my purpose in life? It's like we, we tend to go down a list that like, well, you know, this is my job. Like, what do you do? Well, it's like, well, this is my job. These are my hobbies. This is how many kids I have. Or, you know, like I, I'm dating somebody or I'm married or this is where I live. Your primary purpose in this life is you have been given a new identity and is that you are a witness of Jesus Christ. That you are a witness of the risen Lord. And if that is your job, think about it. You, people go to school, people get training. People know that in order to do this job, I need to have certain skills. I need to have certain knowledge. That is important for me important to be able to do my job. And if my job is to be a witness of the risen Lord, then I need the spirit of the risen Lord. It's, but what I'm talking about this morning is not receiving something you don't already have. It's being awakened to the power in which you already do have. It's being awakened to the power of the Holy Spirit to whom you already have. So for 10 days, they wait. And then in Acts 2, here's what happens. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Can you imagine being in that room? 120 people, male and female, young and old, praying. And all of a sudden it's filled with the presence of God, the, the spirit of God, the power of God. This scene reminds me of a couple of Old Testament passages. In Isaiah 6, the prophet is caught up into a vision while he's praying and he sees the Lord seated on the throne. And there's these angels that are above him and they're declaring holy, holy, holy. And it, they also say the whole earth is filled with his glory. And it's says that the doorpost and the thresholds of the temple shook and the place was filled with smoke. It reminds me of in 1 Kings chapter 8 that the Ark of the Covenant was brought into the temple and it says the glory of God in the form of a cloud filled the temple. We see in Exodus chapter 40, we see that the cloud covered and filled the tabernacle with the glory of God. Why do I point out those passages? All three of those passages had to do with either throne, temple, or tabernacle. And all three of those places, so the temple and the tabernacle were the only place on earth where the full presence of God dwelt in the Holy of Holies. They knew this, the people in this room knew this, that that was the place where God's power resided. But now, parallel picture in the future, we have 120 ordinary people in an ordinary upper room, not priests in the, in the real sense and not in a temple, but in the same way, the glory of God falls and the presence of God falls and the spirit comes upon them. It's no coincidence. It says in verse three, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. I want to stop on that phrase, rest on. If you want to mark that or whatever, rest on. And here's why that matters. When Jesus was baptized by his cousin, John, in the Jordan River, it says that the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. And his father said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And it says that the dove, in the, the spirit in the form of a dove came and rested on him. Same language. And here we have the disciples. Same, the spirit came and rested on Jesus 
the Spirit comes and rests on these 120 in this upper room. Same language. This is just so mind-blowing to me. When I think about, oh, I'm going to jump to verse 4. I'm supposed to finish the verse. It says, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them. Fire in Scripture is a sign of numerous things. It's a sign of judgment. It's a sign of power. But I don't know, maybe just a Matthew connection of like, oh, that might be cool, is it made me think about how Moses received the revelation of God through a fiery bush. That God spoke through a fiery bush, but now, okay, let's take that story, but now God is going to speak through a people on fire in the Holy Spirit. Everyone in the upper room, old, young, male, female, is filled with the Holy Spirit. Or to look back on Jesus' words in Acts 1, 5, they're, they're baptized in the Holy Spirit heal. heal. The words uh, in, in Luke, there's certain words that can be used interchangeably. This idea of baptism in the Holy Spirit, this idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit, this idea of the Holy Spirit coming upon you or to fill you. When the Spirit comes upon them in power, according to the promise of Jesus and the prayers of the people, they begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, I don't think that this is a... I don't think this reference to tongues here is a picture of what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through chapter 14, because here's the crazy things that happen, is that all of a sudden these regular, ordinary Galileans begin to speak in actual languages as the Holy Spirit enabled them. It'd be like right now, I just start speaking German and I just start speaking French or I just start speaking Spanish. I can't speak any of them. So if that happens, hey, I mean, I'm just... That'd be crazy. Just know I don't know how to speak any of those languages. I took Spanish two twice for a reason. All right. <clears throat> it was not because I was interested, just to put it like that. It says in verse five, it says, now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't, these all, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. Can I get a round of applause? We hear them declaring, it says, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, amazed and, per amazed and perplexed. They ask one another, what does this mean? What does this mean? What made this very obvious to all those hearing is they understood these are just Galileans. Galileans don't speak different languages. In fact, they probably would have judged them and criticized them. They can't barely own speak their own languages. Like that, that's how they viewed, like, like redneck Galileans was how they might view it. And it might be tempting, I just want to share this story. It might be tempting to think, well, this is just a one-time thing that never happens again. And let me just tell this. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit, and you can't tell the Holy Spirit what to do. Okay, so I'm not ever going to sit up here and say, well, hey, you know, if you do this and you tap your foot six times and you pray this a certain way, you'll do this. Uh, you're not God. And you're not here to test him and tell him what to do to you. Okay, but I do know, too, I know a couple people personally, genuinely, that have gone on foreign mission trips to other countries. And as they were preaching, the translator was translating. And as they were preaching, the translator was translating. And then all of a sudden, the translator stopped translating. Why? Because all of a sudden, the translator didn't need to translate. Because all of a sudden, these people that did not know how to speak that language, the Holy Spirit was speaking it through them, and they didn't even know they were doing it. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Remember, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that Jesus spoke about in Acts 1-5 was one that would empower them for ministry, and not just any type of ministry, but a multicultural worldwide ministry. Is it not fitting that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit here, what happens is, is it shows that Acts 1-8 is really the vision of God, because the outpouring of the Spirit in this moment led towards the nations hearing about God. And let me tell you, the Holy Spirit is here to comfort you. He's here to be your advocate. I believe that. He is here to bring peace. He is here to help that burden be light and your yoke be easy, like all of that. But the Holy Spirit is not here just to make you comfortable on your couch as a Christian. There's times for relaxation, but the mission is go. Wherever the Spirit says go, you are witnesses. That is your primary job, whether you're at the gas station, on a plane, crossing state lines or another country, or walking down food lines aisle. You are a witness. And the cool thing about America right now is that the nations come to us. 
That doesn't mean that we shouldn't go on foreign mission trips. But I mean, just to see the nations come here in so many different ways, the Holy Spirit poured out at Pentecost was to give us the power to be multicultural, worldwide witnesses. Now, what was the outcome? We'll look at more of this as the weeks go on. But what happened was uh, Peter and the rest of them were accused of being drunk. He's like, it's nine in the morning. Not that he was saying it would be different another time, but he was saying that it's nine in the morning. Like, what is wrong with you people? He said, what, has wit- what you have just witnessed is this is what Joel prophesied in in Joel chapter two is that one day that God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And that is what you have witnessed. And he preaches that Jesus, the Messiah, the one that the Israelites have been waiting for, this was him and that he was crucified to pay the penalty for their sins, that he conquered the grave so that he could conquer ours. And they asked, what must we do? It says they were cut to the heart. And Jesus says in Acts 2, not Jesus, Peter says in Acts 2, 38 and 39, Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And 3,000 people confessed Jesus as Lord and were baptized that day into the family of God. That is what happened that day. Now what I want to do is I I want us to jump a couple chapters. We're going to jump around, okay? So take notes today. Um, I'm going to look at a theme throughout the whole entire story because here's what I want you to get. Sometimes in church, we like to develop theology and uh, I do too. Um, but what we like to do is we, one thing I've noticed is whatever tribe you come from, we can, be, we, we can become obsessed with certain moments. Can be, this, the, the initial moments are something we always really get into, whether it's the moment you were baptized or the moment you prayed a prayer or the moment you walked an aisle or the moment you, were, you, know, the, you experienced like a, like a baptism of the Holy Spirit and all of a sudden these things became oh, uh, you know, powerful in you. And we, we, we obsess over moments and we don't look at lifetime. We say, well, hey, I'm this because this happened. But all I know is Jesus said, I judge a tree by its fruit. And what I can tell you is this, is the book of Acts shows that he poured out the spirit at Pentecost, but he also continues to pour out the spirit after Pentecost. Pentecost is the era in, in which that we are in. It's, this, it's, this, it's the era of the Holy Spirit in the church and that we can need continual, like the song said, of to pour out your Holy Spirit that we just sang. We need continual outpourings. As we see in Acts 4, what happens here is the same group that received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. And Peter and John, they walk in uh, near the temple. There's a lame guy there, and he asks for money. He says, silver and gold I don't have, but in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And lo and behold, he got up and walked. And then all of a sudden, the crowds came rushing in because of what had happened and what they heard about. And then Peter started preaching, and people were astonished. And let me tell you, the Jewish officials didn't like it, so they threw them in prison. But you know what happened? 2,000 more people became a part of the family of God. Let me just say this. The gates of hell will not prevail against this church. Is that he, they threw Peter and John in prison, and so they bring him out the next day. And they're like, hey, by what name and by what power did you do this? And we're going to look at this sermon next week, but by what name, by what power? They, they explained. It was by faith, by faith in the name of Jesus, the risen Lord, that this man was healed. And it says that salvation is by no other name under heaven except Jesus Christ. And then what we see here is this just blows my mind. Is that Peter and John, okay, they just got arrested. Who, like, you know, David asked, I asked, like, hey, how y'all doing? You're like, uh, how would your week have been if you got arrested this week? Anybody, like, like rated a 10? <laughs> like, you might look back and be like, that was the worst week. And you'd be like, I'm going to make sure to never do that again. Even if you didn't do anything wrong, be like, I ain't doing that again because I got thrown in jail. But here is what happens is this, is that Peter and John go back to their crew. They go back to their crew and you know what they do? They pray, okay? Not a formula, not every time in the book of Acts, not what I'm saying, but I will say, prayer very often in scripture precipitates the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Not saying that's always how it works because it's not. But they go back and what did they pray? It says this, it says in Acts 4.29, now Lord consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. They asked for more. The thing that got them arrested, they asked for more of it. They were bold. I'd be tempted to be mild. I'd be tempted to, you know, like, let me tell you about Jesus. Like the crowd thing, let's do this one-on-one personal evangelism. Like maybe the crowd scene's not my vibe. But they asked for more. Consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Why? Because they understood that it was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that gave them the boldness to be effective. They knew that was not me. 
The best form of ministry is when you realize that wasn't me. If you or me or the church can look back and say, hey, you know, here's what we happen, here's what happened in you know, the church in our annual report. I like annual reports. And, and here's all the great things in the stats. I like stats. But if you can look back and those are all things that men and women can manufacture in their own power, that's not a move of God. And something I've realized is that you, there are churches. You can grow a church and the Holy Spirit not actually be moving in the midst of it. And that's really scary just to say that. It says in verse 30, it says, stretch out your hand to heal. They asked for more and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the whole place where they were meeting was shaken. And they once again, I added once again, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. They prayed like unbelievable. This reminds me again of Jesus' words in Luke eleven thirteen. How much more? How much more? How much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? It reminds me of James, the brother of Jesus, that he went on in a book entitled with his name in James 4, 2, and says, you do not have because you do not ask God. You have not because you ask not. Luke paints a picture of being baptized and filled by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is a continual experience. This reminds me of, you can jot this down, Ephesians 5, 18. Paul says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. But the word there in the original Greek is be being filled. That you need to be in a position of continually being filled. Every day, something you can pray. Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Baptize me in your Holy Spirit. I pour out your Holy Spirit upon me. Because I don't know about you, but I need him every day. I need him every day. This morning... I'm not saying that you don't receive the Holy Spirit at conversion. You do. But can I just say that you don't always experience what you have. You don't always experience what you've received. We need continual empowerment. The mission of God de demands it. In Acts 8, I want to jump there. So turn mentally or turn there. In Acts chapter 8, we'll see in verse 17, word gets out to Jerusalem that revival has broken out in the land of Samaria. Big deal. Jews hated Samaria. You know, there might be a nation in this world or there might be a place somewhere in the state that you actually would prefer revival didn't break out because you want like James and John, you just want God to smite them and like strike them with fire from heaven. Anybody got anybody you want to blast? Don't raise your hand. People will be scared of you. <clears throat> but your inner hand was honest and I respect that. But the Samaritans, there was a revival that had broken out there in Acts chapter 8. And what it says there is the people there said that they believed and they were baptized in the name of Jesus. Okay, these were believers, but we see that Peter and John were like, oh, snap. And the Peter and John ran to Samaria. And the reason they went there is they wanted to make sure that these Samaritans received the Holy Spirit and power. Why? Because Acts 1.8, what Jesus said was that they, needed, they were going to be witnesses when they were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem, Judea, and what? Samaria. And he didn't just want them to be converted. He wanted them to be empowered to join them in the journey of being witnesses of the Holy Spirit. And it says then in Acts 8, verse 17, then the Spirit, then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Do I think laying on of hands is magical? No. Do I believe that very often in Scripture that it says lay hands on the sick and pray for them that they might be healed? You see that in James? So we do that obediently. Do I think that... Jesus could from miles away or other people pray and somebody be healed. Yes, again, the Holy Spirit, you can't contain the Holy Spirit in a box and put theological formulas around them. New Testament theolo theologian Craig Keener says it like this, conversion initiated believers into the life of the Spirit, Acts 2, 38 and 39, but does not automatically confer all the experiences that this new life entails. The lack of experience here for Peter and John concerns them and it's not the ideal. Here's what's mind blowing to me. The story of God Abraham, the, he, the promise was a family, of, a family of nations. And to see Peter and John actually want Samaritans to be on mission with them, to be witnesses with them, like that's something that happens when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of a hard heart. And I just want to let you know, some of you, it's like, man, like one of the greatest miracles would be that that grudge actually dissipates that you actually move towards forgiveness and let go of bitterness. Let me give another example. In Acts chapter 10, we find the Roman centurion, uh, a Gentile, okay, not a Jew, who was a seeker of the God of the Jews. He was generous to, to the poor. He prayed regularly. And it says that as he was praying, an angel appeared to him in a vision and said that there's a man named Peter who's in Joppa. You need to send some people to go get him and bring him back to you. And then the next day, as these men are on their way to get Peter, 
Peter's up on the roof and he's praying. And as he's praying, he's caught up in a trance. And I love this. It says that he's hungry. He's hungry. And and as he's so hungry, God gives him a vision of the sheet descending down. And it has all these different types of food that Jews are not allowed to eat. That's just wrong. Peter's hungry. And then the vision is food, but food he's not supposed to eat. It's like David every week when he always makes a joke that you can't use the Chick-fil-A card on Sunday, okay? Like, it's the, this, this sheet's descending down, and it's food they can't eat, and he says, surely not, God. But then God says, don't call unclean what I have made clean. And then the Spirit tells Peter to go with these men. Peter goes with these men back to the Roman centurion's house, and, and what he does there is that he realizes that what the vision meant, that God shows no favoritism and wants to save everybody in the world, and then it says this in Acts 10, 44. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And then it says after that, that they were baptized into the name of Jesus. Theological formulas. I don't know what your tribe is. I came from a tribe, you came from a tribe. Some of you are like, what's a tribe? You didn't grow up in a tribe, okay? We come, if you grew up in church, you came from different backgrounds. And we see things happen here in different ways in Acts. We see somebody baptized in the name of Jesus and then the Holy Spirit comes on them. We see right here, the Holy Spirit comes on people and then they're baptized in the name of Jesus. And it's like, how does all this work? I'm not here to tell Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father how to do their work. But what I can tell you is that Jesus is in the business of saving and he's in the business of pouring out his spirit. How he chooses to do that and what way that looks in the book of Acts, it gives me freedom to look that it's not always the same way because the Holy Spirit's always wanting to move in different ways. There are some things that I can just clearly show this plus this equals this. There's other times where the Holy Spirit does things in different ways and that actually gives me comfort. The same thing happened to Paul in Acts 9. It says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit and then he was baptized after that. He was baptized after that. I, um, one more passage in Acts chapter 19. It says this. He come, Peter comes, uh, Paul comes to a crowd in Ephesus and says, Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He's talking to a crew that they'd been baptized in the name of, not in the name, but in John the Baptist's baptism, which was a baptism of repentance. He says, he told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And there were 12 men in all. What's this picture look like? Different than the others? They were baptized in the name of Jesus and and it's not like some grand order. It's like almost simultaneously in this moment that they they receive an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They just received and power came upon them. Well, why why do I share all this? Okay, Um, so it's a little hammer. Don't judge me. I almost brought my framing hammer, but I thought people might be scared. And then I thought people might ask, are you handy? And I'd say no, and then it'd be embarrassing. Um, why do I share all this? Um, I share all this because you're witnesses. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're a witness. And in Acts 1.8, it says that, that we are to be clothed with power to be witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And I believe that the Holy Spirit fills followers of Jesus' conversion, but I also believe that after conversion, I need continual filling with the Holy Spirit. I I need him to pour out in the same way that the Holy Spirit, it says in the Old Testament, came upon the prophets and they did what they did. He wants to do that in us today. I I talked to a friend of mine, Neil Leeser, that explained it to me like this. Um, he, He said, the reason you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The reason we need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and have that be a continual thing in the same way it says, take up your cross daily and follow me. It also says, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Is, um, he said, it's kind of like using a hammer and then somebody gives you a nail gun. Now, when I first started doing construction, <laughs> okay, guys, listen. The only reason I did construction was God called me to plant this church 12 years ago. And I didn't have a job for 12 months or for six months. And so I asked my friend who does construction, can I be your little grunt worker who picks up heavy things? And, uh, and so at first he gave me a hammer because he did not trust me with a nail gun. Also, I was gonna bring up a nail gun as well, but I thought it might be scary, okay? Also, I don't have one. Anyways, I could have found one. His point was, when you receive the Holy Spirit, it's like taking a hammer, which isn't ineffective, it works, but then replacing it with a nail gun. Anybody ever use a nail gun? Yeah, that joke is sweet, man. 
Um, dangerous, but really, really cool. But you know what it does? It makes you more effective. You get a lot more work done better, and you smash a lot less thumbs by using a nail gun. It can make us more effective. Here's my desire for us as a church. My desire is not for us to be comfortable. My desire is not just that we do services that we enjoy. My desire is that the lost are saved. My desire is that we go. My desire is that we live out the mission that Jesus gave the church in Acts 1.8. And I know this. Do I understand everything that I'm sharing this morning? No. In humility, I'm on a pursuit of God and a pursuit of the Holy Spirit trying to understand these things more. But what I can't shake is this. I can't shake as I look at the book of Acts that for people that are followers of Jesus, there's times that, like Peter and John in Acts 1.8, I feel like the Holy Spirit just gave me a picture of their concern. That they just wanted to make sure the people in Samaria understood. He didn't just came to save you, he also came to empower you. And I don't know fully what it looks like all the time of this, but I have the concern similarly to Peter and John that us as a church, I don't want us just to do church. I want us to be empowered by the Lord of the church. I want us to be equipped as witnesses by the Holy Spirit. And so I'd love just to ask you to stand. And um, listen, I'm not gonna make you do anything or anything like that, but, but here, here's, I, I just wanna pray over our church. And, um, yeah. and, 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 it, and you can pray this yourself. You, you don't have to pray. But I, maybe if you just so feel led to have a posture of receiving, You don't have to fully understand everything and, and have faith, you know, but there's a faith to believe that, God, I believe there's more. I believe there's more you want to do in me. I believe there's more you want to do in me. And so if just even with outstretched hands, you can pray yourself, you can follow along with me. Father, it says in Luke eleven thirteen 13, that your son Jesus said, how much more? How much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask? Lord, I ask for myself. I ask for these people. Lord, I ask, Lord, that you would baptize us in your spirit. I ask, Lord, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. I ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would rest on us, that your Holy Spirit would empower us. I pray you would awaken in us, Lord. Awaken in us in faith and awaken us through your Holy Spirit to recognize, Lord, that you have called us to be witnesses. You have called us to be witnesses of our risen Lord Jesus Christ. And so, God, would you just fall on us? Would you just empower us? Lord, you said you have not because you ask not. And God, I, I just seek to be obedient in this moment to trust you in this moment and release control in this moment and say, God, this is your church. I just get the picture, Lord, of where in those verses that were quoted, Lord, where your spirit filled the room like it was like a cloud that filled the room or smoke that filled the room. Holy Spirit, I know that you're everywhere at all times, but I also know, Lord, that there's times in scripture where you just fill a place in a different way. And I pray you would just fill this place with your glory. And God, I pray, Lord, that people today would experience you in ways that they never have. God, I pray, Lord, that they would feel your presence in ways that they never have. God, I pray that they would hear your voices, your voice in ways they never had. God, I pray that they would experience, Lord, your power in ways that they never have. Lord, all for you, your glory, your namesake, and your fame, that we might be witnesses for you. In Jesus' mighty, mighty name, amen.